I'm going to start with just a little bit of a, a picture show here. dogs that responded to 9-11 both during the time and then 10 years later you saw some of the older dogs and those dogs have really shaped my life inspired me and one of the things um, that they have encouraged me to do is develop this thing we call the pen vet working dog center and so it is the way we are tr honoring and tributing um, these dogs is by moving forward and opening up this center where we can have knowledge that we share with, it, with all of the people in the working dog world. Uh, we ask the important questions, and we really are looking to figure out how, as veterinarians, as scientists, we can improve their health and their performance um, in the, the really important jobs that they do. So the Penn Vet Working Dog Center opened in tribute on the 11th anniversary of 9-11. It was um, on that day, September 11th, that we opened this past year. Um, and what our goal is, is to really build the best dog for the job. So this is Britt. She's our first puppy that entered the program. And our hope is through our training program and, and all the things that we're doing, we're going to create the hero dogs of the next, the next generation. Why? Why would a veterinary school get into this whole dog training and raising business? Um, well, we're not getting into it as a business. Um, we're getting into it as a scientific venture. Um, but the reason that we're getting into it is the question that you raise, you know, are there enough dogs to meet these needs, to be picky? And no, there are not enough dogs, but also there's not enough information about how to make things better. So we want to take the science to that. You may ask why there aren't enough dogs. Well, first of all, most of the dogs that are doing work are imported from Eastern Europe. Almost all of the military dogs are from Eastern Europe. A lot of the police departments are getting their dogs from Eastern Europe. That Eastern Europe has a great history of producing high-quality, high performance working dogs. Unfortunately, the pressure on those breeding organizations there has been you know, increasing over the years as more and more countries are going to them for their dogs. They're producing more and more dogs that are no longer of the quality of the health of the performance that they used to be. And so that's an issue. But we also feel like we have the knowledge, we have the capacity in this country to breed and train and raise our own dogs for these important national security issues as well as some of the other things that these dogs can do. Um, so that was really one of the motivations for us to start this center. We talked earlier about all of the different jobs that they do. Our center is focusing on detection work um, and really the foundation for any type of detection work. 
Um, so our dogs, once they complete their program, will be able to do any different career path that makes sense for them. The information that we're collecting, that we're gaining, is going to impact the assistance dogs, the protection dogs, but we're not directly focusing on those dogs. The impact is also going to be on the sports dogs and, and potentially even the, the pet dogs. So the information that we get about nutrition, about health, about fitness, about genetics can all benefit all of the dogs in our, in our world. If any of you have trained dogs, you know there's a lot of art into training dogs. And what we're trying to do is bring the art and the science together so that we can really have the opportunity to have it reproducible. So the art of training dogs is fabulous. You've got wonderful people who have the skill, but it's really hard for another person to take that technique, that skill, and recreate it. So if we can try and make as much science into it so that we can share that and have multiple people, not just those people that are so sort of born with the talent. We really want to be able to expand that so that the dogs can benefit from that expertise. So the Penn Belt Working Dog Center has the, is a threefold mission, education, research, and then puppies. Um, <laughs> So the puppies are the fun part. Um, actually, it's all fun. I'm going to just give you a, a taste of what we do education-wise. Um, next month, very soon actually, almost like 10 days from now, uh, we're having our big working dog conference. It's in St. Louis uh, at the Purina Event Center. Uh, we are going to have an amazing array of uh, experts, both in science and in the practical side of things. So we're going to have trainers, scientists, people from all different disciplines of working dogs. So uh, the assistance dogs, the service dogs, the detection dogs, the protection dogs, everyone's coming together and sharing expertise, knowledge, and, and we're actually having some hands-on sessions which are going to be really, really fun. So we're looking forward to that. The, this next um, conference will be in 2014 and it's going to be focused on the health um, of the dog and the handler. So one of the things that we do quite a bit of is fitness training. Um, See if we can make this work. So, eh, maybe you don't need to see it. We use I'm gonna, yeah. cut the sound on that. You really don't need sound. Um, so the fitness training is balance and core strength, knowing where their feet are. Um, and so these are some of the things that we do. We use a lot of these you know, implements, this, these fitness discs, um, trying to get them strong enough to hold their balance and then being able to move their feet in directions because for, particularly for the urban search and rescue dogs, standing on unstable rubble and things, being able to hold their balance and have enough body strength that they're not hurting their back, throwing out their back, um, to balance on these kind of wobbly surfaces. It's a real combination um, of a lot of skills put together, um, as well as a little bit of directability here. I'm asking him to put um, his right feet on one of the stacks and his left feet on the other one of the stacks. Um, and it's a really hard thing to do. And you can see he got it. Um, again, it's all positive reinforcement training. It's fun. Uh, we, we do a lot of first aid lectures. Yeah. That's a great question. So when can we start doing this? We're starting with our puppies on a lot of the non-impact or low impact. Um, there's not a lot of information out there. Um, the agility world is you definitely are not jumping your dog until their growth plates are closed. Um, so we don't know where that special, you know, that particular line. Core strength and flexibility, I feel like you can start any time. Impact stuff, which is jumping, some of the endurance, and some of the real actual strength building, we need to be a little bit slower, but we don't have any data. It's all just what people say. So we're trying to implement some of that so we can start asking those questions. All of our puppies do the balance discs from the time that they, they come to us, um, and we believe that has a really good, strong impact. And it's again, it's low impact, so it's not stressing their joints or bones. But it's a great question and one we need to answer. 
So lots of different aspects that we're teaching. We have veterinary students um, come and spend lots of time with us. It's, it, right now it's a volunteer aspect, but we're hoping to have um, rotation so that you can you know, come for two-week rotation and do working dog medicine with us and, and all of the aspects of the training, the health, the performance um, of, our, of our puppies. The big thing is research. This really did all stem out of 9-11 um, and the work that I've done since that following the health and the behavior um, of the dogs that responded to 9-11. This is where the AKC, the Canine Health Foundation, has been incredible. They've supported my work now for 12 years. And what we can tell you, the bottom line, is that the dogs did amazingly well. They really didn't have the problems that we were anticipating. They didn't have the respiratory problems. They were really able to respond in this environment. One of the biggest things we saw were cuts and scrapes on the dogs. That was the most common thing. But we asked the question, how many dogs needed stitches? How many had severe enough cuts and scrapes to require them to be sutured? Anybody have a guess? 4 dogs out of over 300. 4 dogs. This Kaiser being one of them. Where is he? Right there. Um, remarkable, remarkable. We also didn't, uh, on site, didn't have respiratory issues and ocular issues, which were recognized at Oklahoma City. We didn't have, and part of that may have been we were very proactive in having them flush their eyes regularly. So we think we've made an impact on, on that. Short term, not a big deal. What about long term? Certainly the people that responded were having major issues and have continued to have issues. Lots of concern about respiratory problems, not in the dogs. The dogs have not had respiratory problems. What about cancer? Must have cancer. Of course they're going to have cancer after this. They don't. The incidence of cancer is no different in the dogs that responded than a group of dogs we've been following that didn't respond. So there are similar, similar breeds, um, search and rescue dogs, and, and the cancer incidence is not different. Cancer is high in these breeds of dogs. I mean, almost 40% of our dogs die of cancer or die with cancer, but that's not related to their response to 9-11. So really an important component of understanding, but also collecting the information, the facts, because you've probably heard rumors and stories about dogs, oh my gosh, they're you know, all having these problems, because I certainly have heard those stories, but they're not true or they, they can't be substantiated. The human-animal bond side of it is also really important and really interesting. And we worked with a psychologist who interviewed the handlers for the first three years after 9-11. What we found was that the handlers of canines that were first responders had a lower incidence of post-traumatic stress, PTSD, than the average first responder. Doesn't surprise those of us with dogs. I mean, we know our dogs support us. They're an incredible um, bond that we have. But it was pretty cool to be able to document that, that a dog handler had a better chance of coming out unscathed or mentally unscathed. Yeah? How do you manage your veterinary team to keep like, the same project? I mean, you guys have the same mental strength. So, no, it's a, it, it is a really good thing. I mean, I think as veterinarians, we have that benefit. And when I was there, I went up ni on 9 11, and I was there for 10 days. I had the mental thought that I was able to do my job because I could take care of the dogs. So I didn't have that impact of everyone out there feeling like they were failing to do their jobs, which was finding survivors. So I think, and, you know, and then I hugged the dogs a lot. You know? So it, it really helped. And that's the impact of, of the dogs and the, the, the human-animal bond, the therapy thing I mentioned earlier. See these three firemen? Before that dog walked up, total stone face. They were so morose. They were so, you know, wrapped up in the horror of all of this. All of them were smiling because that dog was there and they had the chance to have just a moment of kind of relief of that stress. So the role for therapy dogs in disaster settings is huge. And there are some people who are going in that direction and really building that. It's really important. And there's a whole group that went out um, uh, to Connecticut after the, the school shootings and brought therapy dogs. And it was, there's, a, there's such a role for that. And we need to be active in that as veterinarians. Also looking out for the dogs. Because my concern with the search and rescue dogs doubling as therapy dogs is, is exhausting. Really have to look out for the dog's benefit. And that's why I'm an advocate. Therapy dogs, search and rescue dogs, they're not doing the same job. Okay. 
The other thing, though, that we found was that if the, do the dog handler, their dog died in the first three years after 9-11, their risk of PTSD went way up. All right, so that bond, that support, they were still relying on that dog for mental support, and they were still buffering. Um, so that, that's an important aspect. But the other thing that I found very interesting was that if the owner had emotional distress, the dog started to show behavioral changes, things like aggression, lack of trainability. So again, that connection is dramatic. How many of you guys are, in, are concerned about canine influenza? I wouldn't be. Oh, oops, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to say that. Um, we did a study in the dogs that play fly ball. You saw what the fly ball environment is like, 300 dogs under the same roof barking and spitting on each other. Um, in 2009, we screened 100 dogs. We had 3% antibodies to canine influenza. 2010, we screened another 100 dogs, zero. So it's not rising, and in those, those were the dogs that we thought, these guys are at risk, because they're coming together, they're close, they're spending two days in this environment. It's not an issue with those dogs. Um, our paper should be coming out in the Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine any, any day. It's online right now describing this. The other thing that was concerning and has to do with you know, what, what is protective, the vaccine that's being used a month after they've been vaccinated, we don't see titers. Does that mean they're not protected? I don't know. But the companies have only tested the impact at 27 days. So I don't know if the vaccine is going to even be that great for these dogs. But we certainly don't see a high incidence. We also looked at over 100 search and rescue dogs across the country. And we did not see any incidence of antibody titers for naturally exposed um, and again, the, the vaccinated dogs, very few of them maintain titers. So, so we're not recommending CIV vaccination for our working dogs or for the flyball dogs. Um, this is a study that we did a pilot this past summer looking at prehydration because we really think that this is going to impact um, both heat tolerance and fitness and, and really ability to function as well as olfaction. If your nasal passages are dry, you cannot get those odorants to dissolve in the mucus layer because it's just all dry. So um, prehydration is preventing dehydration. A lot of people are using things like subcutaneous fluids prior to work. Some people are using oral electrolyte solutions. And the question is, well, there's no physiologic rationale for an electrolyte solution in a dog that doesn't sweat. But what we found in this pilot study, and I don't know if it's just because the dogs love this electrolyte solution and drank four times as much <laughs> if they got to have the electrolyte solution as when they were just getting water. Um, but not only did that they drink more, they didn't lose weight, they gained a little bit of weight over a day. They showed a drop in their hematocrit you know, in, and a drop in their urine-specific gravity, suggesting they were, if not hydrated, maybe even overhydrated. We're a little concerned about that. But no electrolyte changes. Um, and when we did a standardized search, they actually searched better if they had been on the electrolyte solution. So we're going we're gonna to take this to the next level this summer um, down at, on the Texas border. So if anybody wants to test the heat and humidity with us, uh, come on down. And we're going to be um, evaluating the customs and border protection dogs uh, for two weeks down there, looking at these, these different um, prehydration strategies to see how we can maintain those dogs as best as possible and really looking at a number of different parameters um, in that function. Um, so we're really excited about that. That's, that's funded by the Department of Defense, and so it's going to be a, a pretty cool study. Uh, we also have a study that should be coming out uh, soon in the Journal of Veterinary Emergency and Critical Care looking at why police dogs come into our emergency room. Uh, we have a very active emergency room. We have over 28 police departments that use um, our facility for their general care of their dogs so they can come in um, anytime. They pay a flat fee for the year and they, they can come in whenever they want. So they'll come in. Um, and we looked at why they came in and we compared it to why German Shepherd, pet German Shepherds, um, would come into the, to the emergency room. And so what we found was that for the, all German Shepherds, the biggest areas that the reasons they came in were digestive disorders, vomiting, diarrhea, GDV, um, and orthopedic disorders. 
So when we look and we look at the difference between pet German Shepherds, so is this a breed thing or is this a work thing? So we're talking about sort of occupational health. Um, it turns out that there were more um, working dogs that came in with limb lamenesses, limb problems, um, and so that, that definitely is a, a at risk. So lameness from jumping out of the vehicle or from running or you know other things, you know any kind of injuries, cuts and things would would definitely be high on the list. Back injuries common in both. That's a German Shepherd thing. Lumbar sacral disease, um, you know, all of those things are common, whether it's a pet or a working dog. Um, and then trauma was more common in our police dogs, just because of the, the, their jobs. I mean, we had one that was you know, in the car when it rolled over. Um, luckily, he was fine, um, but still, the, the trauma risk is much higher in these dogs. And as far as the gastrointestinal problems, vomiting and diarrhea is big, but we definitely see stress diarrhea in these working dogs, and that may be related to hydration as well. Um, we know in the sled dogs that you know you can get all sorts of stress responses with lack of hydration, and so that is something that that we need to think about. How do we manage that? How do we minimize their stress diarrhea when they're working? The other place that AKC is helping us out is they're funding our DNA bank. We have over 600 blood samples from detection dogs. We have their health information, their behavioral information. And what we're trying to look for is there a genetic signature, not a single gene. There's certainly no search gene. Um, but is there a genetic signature that we can identify to help us with picking out dogs that we want to breed for this kind of work, with you know, making sure that we're not adding in other diseases as we're selecting our populations for this kind of work. So this is an important aspect. It's going to be, it's a big long-term project, um, but we are starting to try and, and tap into that and figure out if we can start to, to parse out, you know, how do we know this dog is going to be a good detection dog versus is really going to kind of not make the grade 